right, well, it's good to see everyone again, and I'm glad to see that things are going so well. Everyone's enjoying these videos. Uh, sorry for the hiatus. I've been very busy with work, as you can imagine. So uh, recently I made a video about what happens if you don't treat prostate cancer. And in that video, we talked about the risk of dying of prostate cancer without any treatment. And I think some of you will be surprised to know that some prostate cancers are not that lethal and others can be highly. And distinguishing what you have can help you make appropriate choices about what to do. But in this video, I want to make a follow-up to that video because I made that video and I felt like mm, I just didn't convey everything that was important. There's much more that people need to know about prostate cancer and non-treatment strategies and where there's a risk of not just death, but everything short of death, specifically metastasis and the consequences thereof. And I thought, man, I really did people a disservice by not discussing the shortcomings or the risk of metastasis uh, in non-treatment of prostate cancer. So this, so again, there's two studies now that have looked at non-treatment of prostate cancer, what we call uh, watchful waiting. Um, in other words, they would just wait for people, they diagnosed people with prostate cancer, this was many years ago, and then they would wait to see if they had any uh, evidence of the cancer spreading, and then when the cancer spread, they'd try to treat it. And uh, there are essentially two, tr two studies, one known as PIVOT and one known as the Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Research Group 4 study, or we all just call it uh, SBCG4. And in these two studies, essentially people were randomized after, diagnos after a diagnosis of prostate cancer to either uh, a prostatectomy or prostate removal or uh, watchful waiting, which means no treatment unless they develop metastasis. And I also shared with you the work from a colleague of mine, Dr. Daskovich, who uh, did sort of a summary of these two papers to look at the risk of dying over various time periods. And those, that's the data we discussed last time. But for those of you who have the intention to really understand this, I felt like I really did a disservice by not talking about the risk of metastasis. So we're gonna look at this study. This is uh, the American study that looked at watchful waiting versus prostatectomy with 29 years of follow-up. Okay, so here is the data from that study. It's just being presented in a different way. And this is how the authors actually presented it initially. And what you see here is that uh, over the course of time, the risk of dying of prostate cancer shown in this dark blue increased over time. Now this is all patients of any age, meaning patients with Gleason 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10 prostate cancer in this cohort. In a second, we're going to talk about what the distribution of patients were in this cohort. This is probably not applicable to everyone, but this should be giving you a general idea, and we'll talk about the details afterwards. But what you see is that in this group of men, that at 23 years, about one-third of them died of prostate cancer. But in addition, you're seeing that there's an, another 25% of patients who had metastatic disease at this time. So almost a one-to-one -one ratio of people who had metastatic cancer that caused death, and then another almost equal percentage of people who had metastatic disease. This is important because obviously we always worry about someone dying from cancer, but cancer can cause suffering in other ways, and that is usually when the cancer is metastatic, people would go on to get medications that generally affect their quality of life, such as medications that lower your testosterone, and this results in people having lower energy, weight gain, lower sex drive. So I think when people are making decisions about whether to do treatment for prostate cancer or not, they should be considering not only the risk of death, but the risk of metastasis. Now, moving on, it's really, really, really important, <laughs> essential to contextualize this data within the, within the study, to understand where the study like what patient population was being studied here. Because if you look at this and you just say, oh, I have prostate cancer, all prostate cancer is the same, therefore I'm gonna have this curve, that is a gross misunderstanding of the data. You need to first understand where your risk is so you can stratify your need for treatment. When you look at the Gleason score of the patients, we find that about one third of these patients had Gleason 6 prostate cancer, and nothing, and then another about 55% of the patients had Gleason 7 disease, and only about 13% had Gleason 8 or 9 disease. In other words, this cohort is very much disproportionately representative of people with Gleason 7 disease. In other words, if you have Gleason 6 disease and you're looking at this table and you're saying, oh, that's gonna be my risk of dying, if you look at it collectively, it's probably a overestimate of your risk of dying of prostate cancer. If you have Gleason 8, 9, or 10 disease, and you look at this data, it is a gross underestimate of your risk of dying from prostate cancer, as these cancers tend to be much more aggressive than the Gleason 7s. 
So now let's look at this survival data again, and let's contextualize it within the context of everything, of everything we learned. First, looking at the low-risk disease patients, we see that the uh, low-risk disease patients really uh, did not have very high mortality rates within the first 10 years, even with treatment or non-treatment strategies. This is the main takeaway. The only people who were dying back in these days were those who were underestimated in their cancer. Their cancer was actually worse than we expected. So we're not going to talk about metastatic risk in this cohort because by contemporary standards, this risk of death and metastasis from Gleason 6 or low-risk prostate cancer is actually probably substantially lower than what's being reported here. When we look at the intermediate risk disease, we now learn that for people with intermediate risk disease, the risk of metastasis was about equal to one half of their risk of, of dying of prostate cancer. So let's look at these watchful waiting groups. So here we look at the Scandinavian study, and we find that, let's say, for example, at 10 years, there was an 18% chance of death with non-treatment of prostate cancer. In other words, you did not have a prostatectomy. We know now from interpreting literature that the risk of metastasis at this point, we know that about 18% of people had died of prostate cancer at this time point in this study, but about half as many to one to one would have actually had metastasis as well. So those of you considering watch waiting for Gleason 7 prostate cancer can estimate that in a worst case scenario, the risk of, of dying of prostate cancer would be around 18%, and, with, uh, and then your risk of metastasis would be another 18% to 9%, somewhere in that ballpark. And, you know, that's a very important factor co to consider. If you add that all up, the risk of you having some suffering from the prostate cancer would be around 27% to 36%. Maybe a little bit lower. We have better strategies these days, but this gives you a ballpark of what a non-treatment strategy for Gleason 7 prostate cancer might look like at 10 years of follow-up. This is why we usually say if someone's going to live 10 years or longer with Gleason 7 prostate cancer, we usually recommend treatment. If people are choosing non-treatment strategies that they consider not just the risk of death, but also the risk of suffering from the disease itself. And if you are at risk of suffering from the disease, that you perhaps consider a strategy of treatment, or at least a discussion of treatment if you think it's appropriate. Now, as I go through this, I really want to just summarize everything in one kind of pithy summary here. And that is to say that collectively, we say that men with Gleason 6 prostate cancer have pretty low risk of metastasis. And I know this data showed that some people died of Gleason 6 prostate cancer, but the main takeaway here is that back then, the biopsy strategies were less accurate than they are now. And as a result, for uh, people with Gleason 6 prostate cancer are actually much, much less likely to ever die from the disease as long as they maintain a surveillance strategy with their provider and you continue to undergo repeat biopsies over time, particularly if there's a change in your PSA or your MRI. Um, and that would give you the window, typically, to identify the cancer before it gets more dangerous and then intervene. For those with Gleason 7 disease, people are starting to explore the use of surveillance. And it's a very controversial topic. And we can see that Gleason 7 prostate cancer can be lethal. And therefore, people in our field are tiptoeing or just kind of putting their toe in the water of trying surveillance for Gleason 7, only 3 plus 4. So 3 plus 4 equals 7 prostate cancer, also known as grade group 2, because it's lower risk of the Gleason 7 prostate cancers, and seeing if they can safely avoid treatment for this cohort. As we saw, there are risks of metastasis in this cohort, but they're not very high. And I think this is a misnomer that we need to, to sort of address. People assume that cancer is always going to be like progressive and uh, lethal. Sometimes that's not true. And sometimes there are competing risk factors with the actual prostate cancer itself. And in someone who has, <laughs> let's say, a reduced life expectancy due to other medical conditions, in that context, it would be reasonable to consider a strategy of non-treatment for, let's say, grade group 2 Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer. Because the risk of you dying of that cancer is low, the risk of it metastasizing in that time period is low, and we just went over the data. 
Now for the people with the Gleason 8, 9, and 10 prostate cancer, these are higher risk prostate cancers. They, they act more aggressively, they're more likely to spread. And this data presented here was a cohort of men where only 13% of the men were Gleason 8 or higher. That's the first thing to remember. So if you look at this data and you think, oh, I have Gleason 8 disease and I'm going to behave like this cohort does, you're going to be underestimating your risk because truly the risk for this cohort is much higher. And if you go look back at our previous uh, video on what happens if you don't treat prostate cancer, you'll find that uh, the risk of metastasis, so the cancer spreading of people with Gleason 8, 9, or 10 disease, is usually 10 to 20 times higher than those with the Gleason 6 prostate cancer. And so the main point for those with Gleason 8, 9, or 10 disease is the risk of this cancer spreading, the risk of these cancers causing death, is higher over a 10-year period than it is for Gleason 7 or Gleason 6 disease. And therefore, for those people, usually treatment is suggested if your life expectancy is uh, greater than five years. Now, I do want to add a huge caveat in this, and I think this is also very important. The key takeaway now, once you've internalized all of this, is to know that the data in contemporary times in terms of outcomes is better than all of the studies I've reported. I report these studies because these are the longest follow-up studies that we have, and nobody does studies now with non-treatment. It's just not ethical. We know prostate, uh, prostate cancer treatment with prostatectomy is effective at reducing someone's risk of death, and we cannot do a study like this ever again. So we have to look at the historic data. But since those times, we've had improvements in radiation techniques, surgery techniques, um, identification of prostate cancer through MRI, improvement in biopsy technology. I've been helpful in that. Um, improvement in the treatment of metastatic prostate cancer with numerous new drugs coming on market. So, uh, and these are all pretty effective. So it's really important to understand that your risk of dying is actually largely overestimated by historic studies and things are better today than they were before. And that's it. I hope you guys appreciate these videos. It seems like you really do. If you want these videos to be seen by others, YouTube works by noticing the number of likes comments and subscriptions. I think subscriptions are the biggest things. I'm trying to just get good information out there because I see people in my clinic every single week who are given very just poor information about prostate cancer. And I want to take the information and bring it to the people who need it so that you can know whether your provider is really up to snuff and you can be educated to have a thoughtful discussion with your provider. And so with that, I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to seeing you guys for the next one. I have some good videos coming up. Next one's probably going to be about surgical techniques used in prostate cancer and how there are actually better techniques than what the majority of people are using out there. And I look forward to sharing that with you soon. Bye-bye.